Hey everybody, it's Derek Clamartin from CodeOpinion.com. You have questions, I have opinions. I posted a request for a Q&A, and here are the top comments I received from subscribers. I'll be answering questions on microservices, messaging, CQRS, and event sourcing. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design, so if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. If at any point you find this video helpful, make sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. All right, so the first question is, what's the difference between service-oriented architecture in microservices architecture? And this is actually a question I get quite often in some of my videos. And the answer to me really is nothing in my mind, depending on your definition. It really depends on what the definition of microservices that you use and what the, different, uh, the definition of SOA is. For the definition of microservices that I've often used in my videos is from Adrian Cockcroft. He defines them as loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded context. And I really like that definition, especially because I do believe that services should be loosely coupled and that bounded context part of it uh, relating to domain-driven design. And that to me is about having services that are kind of the, the owner of a set of capabilities, business capabilities, and then behind that, um, the owner of certain set of data related to those capabilities. To me, this is always what SOA has been. I dislike the term microservices because then often people think of it as being this really super narrow focus and then having these services communicate um, in a kind of a request response method um, that I just, I'm not really a, particularly a fan of. If obviously you've seen some of my videos. So the answer to me is what's the difference between SOA and microservices? Really nothing. I feel like Again, depending on your definition of microservices, if you're going with the definition I like, which is a loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded context, to me, that was, that's what SOA was all along in the beginning. So the next question is, is the Saga pattern an anti-pattern? Since the Saga pattern has a transaction spanning multiple bounded contexts, when is the Saga pattern useful? So no, I don't think it's an anti-pattern at all, but it's very different uh, from doing something like event choreography versus orchestration. So event choreography, you just have boundaries, services, producing events, and the actual entire process of a long running process isn't really centralized to one place. With something like a saga and orchestration, you do have a centralized place. So there is a little bit more coupling because you are creating commands that you're sending to a message broker that are gonna be consumed by a specific consumer that is the owner of that command for it to process. But orchestration in a saga gives you a centralized place where you can define what that long running process is. Now, the thing with the transaction is you don't have a single transaction spanning all these different services. The idea here is that you have compensating actions when things go wrong. So my video uh, describing the saga, which I'll have a link in the description, is if things go wrong, you have compensating actions. So my example in this is when you place an order and it basically has the orchestrator that then is going to need to bill the customer. So it sends that to a particular service, let's say the invoicing or billing service that's gonna charge the customer. Then from there, the orchestration, once it knows that's done, it needs to allocate product in the warehouse to actually ship the product. But if something goes wrong there and it can't, can't actually allocate that product, maybe there isn't enough available, maybe at that point we have a compensating action in our orchestrator to then send a, a refund to that billing service to kind of negate the invoice that we created or to kind of avoid that invoice. So is it an anti-pattern? No, absolutely not. It's just very different from event or uh, choreography and using orchestration where you're kind of delegating in a central spot what that long running process is, but you don't have a single transaction. So the next question is, when should I choose CQRS over CRUD-based RESTful endpoints? So this is an interesting question, and I often get this about like CQRS versus CRUD. And to me, it's really where you want to do it is where you want to be explicit. So in CRUD, when you're dealing with CRUD and you're making changes, let's say you're updating specifically in updates, but it can also be a, a part of uh, creation, is that when you're updating something and you're just sending a mass update of a particular resource, if you want to kind of narrow down what the actual update was, so then you can publish kind of finer grain events. So for example, if you had a customer record and you just have a update customer resource that that's where you're making the request for a restful endpoint to update the customer. If the user at the other end only actually changed one particular property, what was, you kind of have to figure out what it was that they were trying to do. 
With commands, you're being much more explicit about what the users uh, can actually do. Check out my video on creating task-based UIs because it explains this, um, I think, pretty well to describe how being explicit, you can then derive other things to create events and be more event-driven about those explicit things that you're making the user do. All right, so a couple questions about event sourcing, which is in every system, models evolve over time. In a regular application, it can be managed very simply. You migrate your schema so it reflects your model. But how does this work in DDD and event sourcing, specifically event sourcing? For example, you have a model of order item, and later you add quantity field to this model. And so you may want to add quantity to your item was added event. How does this work in event sourcing if you have to change your model and events? So Greg Young has a book about uh, versioning, which is really, I think, the, the gist of the question. So I'll have a link to the ebook. It's on LeanPub to Greg's book. And that's really the long answer is check out the book. Um, but there's two pieces of this puzzle. One is it's very similar to if you were to have, in my mind anyways, if you were to have a relational database and you're adding a new column. If you're adding a new column, you would probably be making um, either some backfill to update old data to new data. But in events, you're not doing that because it's immutable. But what you're doing rather is you're just disregarding new properties that you may add. Again, this is related to if you're not making breaking changes. So if you're adding a new property to an event, that's totally fine because with a weak schema, whoever's deserializing is just going to completely disregard that new property. Now, if you have a new version of an event, you want to be able to have old versions upgrade to that. So that's when I was kind of using the backfill is that when you deserialize something, you realize it's a particular old version. Can you upconvert it to the new version of the event? If you can't, to me, and I believe that's what Greg states in the book, the ebook, is you probably actually have a new event entirely. So versioning, really the best place to deal with this related to event sourcing and how to deal with versioning is really long story, check out Greg's book. It's probably the best place to get this information. So the next question to kind of piggyback on that is what are the best practices and pitfalls when doing event sourcing? Now, I think the biggest pitfall, I don't even know if I'd call it a pitfall, is just the very different way that you're dealing with data and how you're persisting data in your models than what you're used to if you're always storing current state. It's just different. I think there was a video that Greg Young had at a conference a few years ago. Um, I think it's relatively recently. I'll try to find a link, put it in the description, where he was talking about that most people's problem is just because they're unfamiliar with it. And they're saying like, oh, the project failed because of event sourcing. I don't necessarily know that it failed for a, because of event sourcing or just the lack of knowledge of how to deal with it operationally. So I guess one of the pitfalls I would say is that it's very different from when, even when you start picking it up in dealing with it in development and then having to operationally deal with it in production once you have events, which comes up to what I just talked about, versioning. That seems to be kind of the biggest concern once you get going and you have production data and you have events that you need to version. So again, refer to uh, Greg's ebook there. The other one I would say is kind of how you want to expose events. There's often this talk about that you shouldn't expose the events that you're in, are you're in event stream. And I don't know necessarily that I agree with that, meaning that you should probably, the, the standard thing to do would be to have your events in your event stream, in your event store. And then if you need to uh, exchange those with other services, basically map those to integration events. Now, I understand the reasoning of this. It's kind of like just because you can version those separately than what are in your event store, the things that you're uh, integrating with. So you're gonna kind of separate integration events from your actual uh, domain events. The thing is with that is that generally, I'm saying generally, is that domain events are pretty stable once you realize what they are. Yes, you can version them and deal with that, but I don't think they're as likely to change, I guess depending on the domain you're in, but the one I've been in, I think they're less likely to change once you establish what they are. Like I said, they are to me pretty stable. And to have to deal with, if you have something like event store DB, that can be a message broker, that you can have competing consumers, that you can actually pull and do catch up subscriptions to like build out projections or integrate with. That's the beauty of using something like event store DB is it has that functionality. So to add more complexity of having a separate message broker for it, I guess I would just kind of weigh the options, but don't realize that you owe it. I don't think you always have to create integration events. All right, so next question about event sourcing specifically is eventual consistency 
and query retries. This doesn't necessarily need to be about event sourcing, just maybe even if you were using a read replica and there's some latency there, you'd still have this problem. So basically not reading from your write. So retry after HTTP header usage, just to make the point about how you're supposed to deal with eventual consistency and projections. So uh, I think the big thing here is users expecting consistency in how your app works that kind of makes it elude that it should be consistent. Meaning they perform some command. And like I said, whether you're using uh, projections or not with event sourcing, it could just be that you're writing to your primary and then you're reading from a read replica and that there's a delay there. So just again, just having a, an expectation from the users about consistency. Now, ways to deal with this, I think, are just from a user experience point of view. And it can be just as simple as even with a long running process of like I explained in some of my other videos about real time web and event driven architecture is when something finally occurs, an event happens using things like push notifications or uh, things like WebSockets, depending on what you're actually using to then push those events or other events back down to the client to inform them that something's happened. So then you can deal with the UI either by refreshing or showing the user that something's actually happened. An actual technical way of dealing with this besides that is with version numbers and versioning is when you get a particular, you make a query, you get a version of what that projection looks like, of what that re resource looks like. And then when you actually need to say pull again, after you've done a particular command, when you call that resource again, is it the same version? If you know that should be updated, then you know you it, your projection hasn't been updated yet. So whether you're using that a part of your headers of your requests of your query, depending if this is web-based or not, but either way, it's basically passing versions from responses from a queries. And then when you're making calls for queries, using that version again, kind of in the same way as caching to understand whether there's a new version available or whether you got back the response of an old version. All right, so the last question, I guess more on a personal note, is how and when did you start using DDD in CQRS? So this probably goes back to, I think around 2009, 2000, somewhere around there. I think it was before, it was definitely before 2010. I think the first kind of probably stumbled upon some blog post or something. And I remember specifically buying the Domain Driven Design book, which is sitting on my desk right here. Here's the blue book. Um, and from there, I think just reading a lot of content from Greg Young, Udi Dahan, those two people in particular, a lot of conference talks, watching online. And then lucky enough over the years, I've got to attend and speak at different events, uh, specifically talking about most of the stuff I really talk about in, on this channel. And some of the coolest ones are events like Explore DDD, which I w attended, I spoke at um, twice, uh, the last one being just like pre-COVID, which is an awesome uh, event. So hopefully they do that again. So I, yeah, it's been probably a good 10 years or so. Um, and all of my thoughts around it have changed over time. I recently did a video about um, kind of the, doing the, stop doing the dogmatic DDD where everything is really focused on kind of the patterns of repositories, entities, value objects, aggregates. And again, in that video, like I said, that's kind of where I started. That's why I think <laughs> my reasoning there was it has value, but it kind of really misses the point. Hence why a lot of the videos I talk about are boundaries, route context and understanding that, and then applying the, the patterns that are mentioned in DDD that a lot of people talk about to kind of fulfill their kind of a means to the end. So yeah, it's been about 10 years and check out my video about dogmatic DDD, about kind of what my feelings are about domain driven design, what the most important parts are. If I didn't answer your question directly in this video, check out the link in the description to all the original posts, all the original questions. I'm going to try to comment on every one of them, not just the ones that I did in this video, because the video is kind of getting a little bit long. So again, if you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. If you found this helpful, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.